You're listening to I Communicate with your host, Mark Altman, on Full Service Radio, AM 830 WCRN. Once again, here's Mark. Welcome back to everybody to I Communicate, Finding Your Voice, here with my guest, James Donaldson, today, uh, 15 years in the NBA, five teams, and uh, was on the Harlem Globetrotters. James, real quick, before we get to our matter at hand, what was it like playing for the Globetrotters, by the way? Uh, <laughs> that that was quite a treat. Uh, you know, I mean, after 15 years in the NBA, of being very serious and very determined and very, you know, business-like, all of a sudden I'm out there with the Globetrotters for two or three months, and I'm traveling around the country day-to-day to different little cities, and we're putting on an entertainment show. We're, you know, doing the ball behind the back, between the leg kind of thing. We're doing all the little choreographed, uh, you know, layup lines and things. It was fun. It, you know, but people realize how hard those guys actually work, though. I mean, practice every day, travel every day, usually by bus to a town two or three hours down the road. Uh, this is a gruel, grueling lifestyle. Uh, I take my hats off to the guys who did it forever, like Metal Ark Lemon, Goose Tatum, Curly Neal, and all those guys who really were the forefronters of all that. It was, it, But it was a lot of fun. No question. Fun. So, James, I want to talk about some of the initiatives you're uh, doing. I know you're you're in the process of building your nonprofit foundation to work on mental health. I want to talk yeah. about what you're doing overseas in China in you know, your after-school program and and what, what prompted you to work overseas and specifically in China with these kids? Well, about 2010, uh, I, I took a trip over to China for the first time uh, with Charles Smith, a former NBA player who was a teammate of mine. Uh, and we went over there on behalf of the NBA Retired Players Association. Uh, Charles was the executive director at the time. I was the board of director. And we both went over there knowing and, and understanding that the, the new land of opportunities for basketball was going to be in China. Uh, bas- uh, China was just basketball crazy. Uh, Yao Ming was still, uh, you know, going strong and wrapping up his career or in the midst of his great career. Uh, they were watching NBA games uh, in 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, broadcast over to China. And so Charles and I went over there and we said, hey, this, this really is a great place for us to get opportunities for the retired NBA players, uh, camps, clinics. Uh, teaching opportunities, uh, player appearances, autograph sessions, all kinds of things. So that's what Charles and I did. Uh, I got involved with the educational piece because sports and education and and youth programs all kind of naturally overlap each other. And so while I was doing the basketball piece, I started meeting a lot of educators who knew I was well-connected with quite a few colleges and universities here in the United States. And we started talking about study abroad programs for the Chinese students, uh, how they help more and more students come here to study at the university levels. And so that's something I've been doing for quite a while. Uh, the after school programs are basically based in China, where we go to the schools and we do a little bit of basketball training, maybe a little bit of English teaching in the classroom, uh, cultural insightness classes of what life in America is all about. And these kids, uh, are just thirsty for this information. They, they, they see it on TV. They get some, some of it through the Internet. But they to meet a real-life American who can come and talk to them and be, be palling around with them for a while is, is a treat that they never, ever forget. So, James, I'm going I'm to ask you two really, I'm going to put you on the spot in a good way, two really difficult questions here before we wrap up. So, first, let's look at the NBA. So, let's say that Money is no object. You have a magic wand, and you could make a change in the NBA to make it more comfortable for players to advocate for themselves, to put more of a focus and emphasis on resiliency. What is something, if money were no object and you were given the power, you would do right away? Right away, I would, I would utilize the retired NBA players as a personal mentor for each and every current NBA player. Uh, match them up according to their personalities or characters, what have you, because the retired NBA guys, we've been there and we've done that. We know what the life is like during our playing days and after our playing days. And that would really help our young players be much, much better prepared for life after the game. 
so many of them are not prepared. So many of, of the retired players were not prepared. Uh, but they find out quickly that life is a, a real grind out there. And once the spotlight is off you, you're, you're a regular working Joe again, and you've got to really be able to handle yourself and manage the monies that you made during your NBA career. So, James, what's... Young play- no, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, these young players coming out now, they, they may have a nest egg of 40 or $50 million. But, you know, they're 28, 29 years old, their career is over, now what? And so that's the big question to help them with that transition. So what, what stands in the way? I mean, is it a money thing where is it resistance from the, from the current players? Is it a combination of both or other things? What, what stands in the way? Because it's obviously a great idea. So what's preventing it? Well, I think, you know, the NBA, like any major corporation in America, is, is just that, a big business, big corporation. Uh, they don't want uh, a real educated workforce. Uh, they want that. <laughs> That's great. Oh, I'm boy. serious. <laughs> they they don't you know because all of a sudden if you if, if you educate the guys, I was just watching the historical piece the other day on on Kurt Flood and Oscar Robinson, mm-hmm. and Jim Brown, and these guys who really in the '60s were starting to fight for players' rights and and better contracts, and they educated a lot of people that hey you're being taken advantage of, so you have to be able to have something to push back on. So the NBA is no different. Uh, the NFL is no different. They don't want an educated workforce. They want guys who are young, dumb, don't ask questions, take the money, don't give them any problems. But if you educate them, they'll start asking questions. They'll start carving out a better leverage position for themselves. And that's what us retired guys can help those young guys with because we've been through all of this. So, James, at the and same question, at the high school and college level, you're king for a day. You've got a magic wand. Money's no object. What do what do our educational institutions? What could we do immediately in for resiliency and mental health in that regard? Well, I think uh, you know, supplying and having available greater me- uh, mental resources or uh, mental health resources would be the first step. Uh, you know, we all talk about it. We all act like we have a great program ready to handle. I just heard from uh, a parent from WSU, Washington State University, my alma mater, a couple of days ago. Uh, her son attempted suicide over the last weekend on the campus of Washington State University. The son reached out for mental health resources. Uh, they had a waiting line of four months before they could even get in and see someone to talk to them. And that's just unacceptable. That I mean, this is a kid who's ready to kill himself. And you've got a four-month waiting period? Please. So this is the kind of thing. You know, a lot of these institutions talk about all the great work they're doing. But in reality, they're coming up woefully short. And we have to be able to do a better job with that. So this is my new mission is to go around and be a voice, be an advocate, speak, speak all over the country to groups, to students, to student-athletes about mental health and how they can handle themselves in a better way, a different way, and work their way through it. And James, before I get to my last question, uh, just want to ask, for people who want to support what you're doing for your foundation, what is the best way for them to reach out? What can they be doing? What would you suggest? Well, you know, I'm all over social media, so you can easily find my social uh, Facebook pages on on uh, James Donaldson, just just go ahead and uh, search for that. Or on uh, Twitter with Team Donaldson, I have a, a Twitter handle, Team Donaldson. Uh, I've got a why not uh, eight hundred uh, toll free number. People can call and we can discuss. We can uh, leave a voicemail. I'll get right back to you. Uh, that is eight hundred seven four five three one six one. Okay, eight hundred seven four five three one six one. And I'll be more than happy to discuss. I'm, I'm getting into more of the life coaching uh, aspect of this as well. Uh, a lot of folks who just need somebody to talk to, somebody to, to understand what they're going through. And I want to make myself available for that kind of thing as well. Um, but just reach out any of those uh, var- variety of ways, and I will Great. shoot an email back to you, and get and we'll get the ball rolling and really make sure that you're on track to, to, to work through anything that you're going through. All right, James, last question, fun question, uh, two-part question. Uh, in your playing days, who was your favorite player to play against? And now, 
Who is your fav- favorite player to watch? And I don't mean from like a highlights perspective. I mean from a you value their work ethic. There's something that really you connect with. So what are your thoughts on those two? Yeah, well, I don't know if I had a favorite player to play against. <laughs> they were all difficult and hard. Um, people ask me that a lot, though. And I'd say the most difficult player for me to play against, uh, being a big guy like I was, uh, was against Moses Malone. Uh. Moses was he was just a workhorse. He was not flashy and dashy, and he would just wear you out and beat you to death down there with that energy he had. Uh, along came a new and improved version of Moses Malone, and that was the Kim one, who was just as difficult to guard as Moses was. But the most unstoppable player ever for me was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Wow. Uh, no matter how high you jumped to try to block that sky hook, it was, <laughs> it was just... It, it, by the time you landed on the ground and you turned your head to look, and it's just nestling its way through the net uh, each and every time. It was so hard to guard Kareem. But, so, of course, I played against the great ones. Uh, Michael Jordan was always exciting to play against him and his team, Larry Bird, uh, Charles Barkley, Dr. J, uh, all of these great, great players. Uh, so, 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 yeah. I, so, James, yeah, no, thank you. That was, That's uh, very interesting. And uh, so we're, we're going to wrap up. James Donaldson, thank you so much. Looking forward Thank to working you. with you and helping your foundation and collaborating and really appreciate you taking so much time today. So thank you very much. James Donaldson, former NBA center for the Dallas Mavericks, uh, advocate of all ages for mental health. And uh, thank you for joining us for I Communicate, Finding Your Voice. We'll see you same time next week. Have a great afternoon. Go Sox! You've been listening to I Communicate with your host, Mark Altman, on full-service radio, AM 830 WCRN.